Today, um, I'm presenting on some work I did during my PhD when I was at Loughborough University, and it's called Local Energy for Sale, an experimental analysis of consumer decision making in peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platforms. So it was done at Loughborough University jointly with my supervisors, my PhD, Anarita Bernardo and Monica Giuliani, who were still at Loughborough. So first I'll start with a bit of background on the topic. So we all know that you know, the world is going through some global energy challenges, for example, with climate change and you know, trying to reach net zero. And in order to address these challenges, I think that we definitely need a whole system approach, incorporating both in connected, interconnected and localized solutions. And you know, looking at the entire energy um, chain from the large scale producers to the end consumers. So as a result of this energy transition and um, the increased decentralization and adoption of renewable energy technology, new local energy markets have been emerging and these markets allow for more active participation by the end consumers. In order for these um, markets to actually work, they require most times the use of a platform for example, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platforms are emerging as these new online marketplaces where market actors like prosumers can sell their surplus energy at their desired price to consumers who are willing to pay this price. So essentially, prosumers are just energy consumers who also have microgeneration technology, so they could produce their own energy as well. So they're producers and consumers. So from the diagram, um, they could sell the excess electricity back to the to the electricity supplier. For example, in the UK, we have the smart export guarantee where they get like paid for the amount that they sell back to their supplier. But if they use the platform, like a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform, they can now have the opportunity to just cut out the middleman of their supplier and sell the excess electricity directly to other consumers in their community. So along with this platform, these types of platforms, there are some opportunities and benefits. For example, it increases renewable energy deployment, it increases flexibility to the grid, and the consumers and consumers could be more empowered and kind of like take their energy consumption into their own hands. And it could also potentially help them reduce their bills by cutting out the intermediary. In addition to some other benefits like balancing and congestion management, um, improve energy access, and others. But in addition to these benefits, there are also some challenges with getting the whole, with like diffusing these platforms more. For example, there are some technical and regulatory barriers. Like in the UK, there isn't really a regulatory framework that allows this type of trading yet. But in addition to these, there are some social and economic challenges that need to be addressed. For example, with these platforms, in order for them to work and be sustainable and operational, it requires continuous participation from consumers and prosumers, because prosumers have to be willing to you know, continuously supply energy and consumers have to demand it in order for it to be functional and meet demand and supply. So there's definitely a need to understand consumer behavior and demand a bit more. And when designing the platform, they need to make sure that the business models meet the preferences of these consumers and consumers. And if they you know, use specific pricing mechanisms to decide on trading prices, they should be consumer centric they should consider consumer behavior and decision making. For example, a lot of studies propose using auction mechanism. So this is where the prosumers could set, set a bid price for how much they're willing to sell their electricity for, and the consumers could set a maximum price they're willing to pay for electricity. So by using mechanisms like these, people would be able to you know, receive their true preferences for how much they're willing to pay and accept. So, since these platforms don't really have an intermediary to specifically set market prices, and consumers and consumers have to you know, set their own bid amounts, 
This brings about a social dilemma. So people could decide to maximize individual benefits. For example, consumers might set really, really low prices that they're willing to pay because they're trying to make a lot of savings on the energy bills. And on the other hand, consumers could set really high prices that they're willing to sell at um, to kind of make the most of the earnings on their electricity. So they could decide to maximize their own individual benefits or they could be more cooperative and maximize the benefits of everyone in the platform and also environmental benefits. Because like I mentioned, if all participants just you know, think about themselves and don't cooperate, there'll hardly be any transactions taking place because no one would accept bids and then the platform won't work. So given the important role of these consumers and consumers in making platforms like this sustainable and operational, we definitely need to consider their behavior and decision-making strategies if we want to move the platform forward. So that brings me to the aim of this research, which was essentially to provide an empirical insight into consumers' trading decisions to determine if they would maximize individual benefits or community and environmental benefits. I had a few research questions. Essentially, I want to look at how much are consumers willing to pay for electricity in a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform to see you know, if they're willing to, to pay what's kind of realistic and yeah. And then how does consumers' willingness to pay change when they are provided with additional information on other market actors in the platform? And finally, what are the determinants of consumers' willingness to pay? So the theory behind this, um, the theory behind this is essentially, <clears throat> well, starting with neoclassical economics, and theories like self-regarding preferences, it suggests that consumers generally only care about their own consumption and they choose to maximize individual benefits. But we, when we consider behavioral economics and like theories like altruism and recipro yeah, reciprocal altruism and fairness, um, they found that consumers actually you know, consider other people's preferences as well and not only their own so it kind of challenges the traditional economic theories and shows that people do exhibit pro-social behavior and similar game theory studies in this area found that people tend to allocate money in a fair and equal manner so they are, are actually fair and cooperative so i in terms of the hypothesis we know that consumers pay an energy tariff to their electricity supplier. So we would assume that if consumers are rational, if they participate in this platform, they would want to pay less than their current energy tariff because they want to, you know, make savings on their electricity bill. Also, what would be the point of, you know, switching suppliers to the platform? So I would assume that consumers would be willing to pay somewhere below the energy tariff on the diagram. But if they find out that consumers typically only receive like this amount, like five pounds for every hundred kilowatt hours they send, they send to the platform, um, they would want to, rational consumers would kind of want to take advantage of that and they might reduce their willingness to pay all the way down to consumers export tariff rates because that way they could you know take all of the benefits for themselves maximize individual savings but if we consider the behavioral economic side and their pro-social behavior i would assume that um, consumers would reduce their willingness to pay for electricity but they would you know price uh, have a willingness to pay somewhere in the middle so that all market actors could um, make benefits. So I essentially hypothesized that willingness to pay would be somewhere in the middle of consumers' energy tariff rates and consumers' export tariff rates if we give them the right information. So in addition to that, 
I also assume that willingness to pay is a function of individual socioeconomic values and characteristics and their attitude in all variables. So there could be a number of factors that influence how much individuals are willing to pay for electricity in the platform. For example, their social norms could influence their decision, their desire for autonomy, maybe from the electricity supplier that could make them want to pay more for electricity in a platform, their peer relationships, biospheric values, their pro-environmental behavior, these could all affect how people value electricity in a platform. Also, their behavioral biases, like their status quo bias, because they might think, you know, this isn't like the norm, so they might not want to pay as much. Also, loss and risk aversion, present bias. And finally, some other socioeconomic characteristics, demographic and contextual variables have been found to influence willingness to pay. In terms of the methodology, I used an incentivized survey experiment, which I administered online to energy consumers. Um, it was a total of 1,044 consumers. But this was split across, across three different countries, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And the reason I chose these countries is because I wanted to um, kind of have countries with different characteristics. For example, among these three, the big difference is in renewable energy technology adoption. Like in the UK and Italy, there are much more households with solar panels compared to Spain. Um, in the three countries, there are also different financial incentives for consumers to sell their electricity. Like in the UK, I mentioned there's the Smart Export Guarantee, and previously there was the feed-in tariff, but Spain, on the other hand, doesn't really have much for, I think, any incentives really like that. And then there are also differences in the three countries across energy consumption and energy electricity prices. So to distribute the survey, I did the panel recruitment through a market research company and also to some energy cooperatives in the three countries who send the survey around to members of their energy communities. And it was incentivized with a lottery. So the respondents had the chance to win a prize. And finally, in terms of the survey structure, it was a contingent valuation experiment was the main part of the survey. And then following that, I had some questions related to the respondents' socioeconomic, demographic characteristics, their values, attitudes, behavioral biases. So I wanted the survey to be random sample, but also representative of the wider population of the country. So based on some data from Eurostat, this just shows the comparison of my sample compared to the country's population. So for example, in Italy, I had 338 respondents. Um, this is the breakdown by age and gender. Um, Spain, I had 350 respondents and the UK, 356. So in all three samples, there was a slight over-representation of the 25 to 34 age group and an under-representation of the 55 plus age group. Um, in terms of gender, it was fairly representative of the population. So on to the contingent valuation experiment. This was the main part of the survey that allowed me to investigate their willingness to pay. So this is essentially a type of stated preference technique that is typically used to kind of investigate individuals' preferences and is generally used to value non-market resources. So resources like, you know, electricity in a platform, which is not necessarily like a commonly known thing that people are familiar with. So it'll be hard to put a value on it if we just ask them directly. 
So that's why we use contingent valuation experiments to kind of elicit the preferences out of them. So we essentially give them a hypothetical, hypothetical market situation, describing the platform, describing like the trading and how it works, just giving them all the information about it. Then at the end, we ask them their willingness to pay a certain amount for the product or service. And the reason this type of experiment is useful is it is better than open-ended questions because by giving them the description of the market and the info, everyone in the experiment, we know that they have the same level of information about what we're asking them. And we specifically use a double bounded dichotomous choice, choice method, which I'll explain. So this is just an example of the experiment. So before this, I gave the description of the platform, the description of the trading activities. But then I asked the question, when you buy electricity from your current supplier, you pay 14 pounds or euros, for every 100 kilowatt hours you purchase. Are you willing to pay X amount for the same amount of electricity from a member of the platform previously described? So um, the respondents were randomly allocated a different starting bid amount, either eight pounds, 11 pounds, or 14 pounds. So they were asked, are you willing to pay eight pounds? Are you willing to pay 11? Or are you willing to pay 14? And so, like I mentioned, it was a double bounded model, which just means that based on their answer to the first question, they were shown a follow up question with a different amount. For example, if they said, No, I'm not willing to pay eight, months, eight pounds, they were asked if they'll be willing to pay five pounds. If they said, Yes, I'm willing to pay eight pounds, then they were asked if they were willing to pay 11 pounds because this kind of just gives a sharper bound of their willingness to pay. Like we could tell their willingness to pay lies between a certain amount or is more than a certain amount or less than. So it just kind of makes it more clear, you know, the range that they're willing to pay. So that was the first experiment. But then we had a second experiment where I basically ask the same thing, give them the same information about, you know, you paid this much, but I also gave them information about the prosumers and like just additional market information. Specifically, you find out that if a member of the platform were to sell the same amount of electricity to their supplier outside of the platform, they would receive five pounds or euros. So with this, like I mentioned, based on neoclassical economics, like rational consumers only think about themselves, so you would think that consumers would now be willing to pay only like five pounds because they know that prosumers would get this amount like anyway. So like why should they pay more? And they'd want to take all of the extra savings in the platform for themselves. So that's just based on, you know, neoclassical economics. But obviously, based on behavioral economics, they might be more pro-social and like try to share the benefits among both sides of the platform. So, like I mentioned, um, the respondents were randomly allocated to one of three different bid amounts, and this was to avoid initial bid biases. So for example, in Italy, 116 people were first asked if they were willing to pay eight pounds. 108 were asked about 11 pounds. 114 were asked about 14 pounds. And so on to Spain and the UK. So this is just the empirical model that was applied to kind of analyze the willingness to pay. So, since they were asked two questions, there were four potential outcomes of their responses. For example, they could say yes to the first bid, yes to the second bid. They could say no to the first bid and no to the second bid. 
can say yes to the first bid, no to the second bid, no to the first bid, and yes to the second bid. So just one example, if the first bid that they saw was eight pounds, a person who said yes to eight pounds would have been shown the bid of 11 pounds. And if they said yes to that, we know that their willingness to pay is more than or equal to 11 pounds. Um, if they said yes to eight pounds and they were shown 11 pounds and they said no, we know that their willingness to pay is between eight and 11. If they said no to eight pounds and they were shown the bid of five pounds and they said yes, we know that willingness to pay is between eight and five. And then if they said no and no, we know that their willingness to pay is less than five pounds. Hopefully that makes sense. So in order to like actually analyze this and get an average willingness to pay, we refer to the interval model, which is like a popular um, method used to, used to analyze contingent valuation responses. So this model assumes that the respondent refers to the same underlying willingness to pay in both their first and second responses. So if we assume that respondents are utility maximizing, the four outcomes have the following likelihood. So this is just the probability that they say yes and yes is the probability that the high bid that they were shown is more than, sorry, is less than the maximum willingness to pay. And this is equal to one minus the cumulative density function of their maximum willingness to pay. And so on for the other three um, responses. So this just gives the log likelihood function of their responses. So for example, dyy, is just a binary variable representing the an individual's response. So it would be one if the respondent said yes, yes, and zero otherwise. And bi just represents the initial bid that they were shown, and bh represents the high, higher bid that they were shown. And then n just represents the total of all respondents. So the maximum likelihood estimator is just the solution to this, the first order condition of the log likelihood function. So this is just the model behind it, but in terms of the actual methodology that we use to estimate willingness to pay, we could use either a parametric model or non-parametric model. So in this, um, in my methodology, I use a parametric model, which assumes that willingness to pay is a linear function of the characteristics of the survey respondent. So I use this parametric double bounded estimation, which is based on maximum likelihood. So in this estimation, the first and the second variables represent the first and second bid variables that they were shown. For example, if they were shown eight first and then 11, then the third and fourth variables are dummy variables represented their responses to the first and second bids. So if they said yes to the first one, the variable is one. If they said yes to the second one, the variable is one. And this estimation also included some other covariates and control variables to see how their characteristics affect their willingness to pay. These are some of the results. It just shows the distribution of responses by initial bid amounts. So for example, in Italy, for those that we asked if they'll be willing to pay eight pounds, 52% said yes. Yes, um, those who were asked about 11 pounds, only 37% said yes, yes. And those who 
asked if they would pay 14 pounds, only 22% said yes to that and yes to the follow-up bit. So it just kind of goes to show some initial rationality in their decision-making because the higher the bid amount, the higher they would have to pay for the electricity, the less likely they are to accept the bid. So of course it shows that they are interested in making savings to some extent because they're less willing to pay higher amounts for electricity from the platform. Um, and the same person was found in Spain and also the UK. And then as you can see as well, as the bid amount increases from eight to 11 to 14, the amount of people said no increases. So again, same thing, like they are rational. They make rational decisions and choices so far. So this is the result of the willingness to pay estimation. So this basically shows the average willingness to pay of you know, if we consider everyone in the sample. So out of 338 Italian respondents, the average willingness to pay was 12 pounds, and sorry, 12 euros, 77 cents. Um, in Spain, it was 13 euros and 75 cents. And in the UK, 14 pounds and 25 pence. So, this was in experiment one, where the only information we gave them was, um, you usually pay 14 pounds or euros for electricity. So it is interesting that the UK was willing to pay basically 14 pounds. So they're willing to pay the same amount in the platform as they normally pay. So they don't really like seem to want to use the platform to make savings not really sure. Um, so experiment two was where I gave them the additional information saying prosumers usually sell this for five pounds. So are you still willing to pay eight, 11, 14? So this is where I assume that they would decrease how much they would be willing to pay when they realize that they could you know, make more savings. Um, and they did decrease to some extent, but only just a little, like in Italy, it only went down to 12 euros and 30 um, cents. In Spain, it went down to 12 euros and 90 cents. And in the UK, 14 euros, so not so much. This diagram just shows the willingness to pay in you know, a graph. Um, so like I mentioned, they were told that they usually pay 14 pounds. So one would expect maybe that they would be willing to pay a bit less than 14 pounds in the platform but when they realized that they could make some savings. But in most cases, it was not that much less. But I mean, it was less, so I guess to some extent they would want to make savings from using the platform, especially in the case of Italy. But for the UK, I guess they just value electricity from the platform the same as they would value electricity from their electricity supplier. And I guess they don't see why they would pay any less for it. So I think that, I think I could say though that Spain, Spanish consumers were the most interested in maximizing savings because their willingness to pay decreased the most compared to Italy and the UK. So I did expect that they would reduce their willingness to pay a bit more, you know, maybe to somewhere in the middle of the prosumer tariff and the consumer tariff so that they could, you know, also make some savings and prosumers can make some additional earnings. So, yeah. so like I said, willing to stay in all three countries decreased a little, suggesting a little bit of economic rationality and some interest in their own consumption. 
But since their willingness to pay was so close to how much they already paid, I would say that the main pricing strategy isn't really to maximize individual savings. Like if they join this platform, it would be, you know, specifically just so that they could save money on electricity bills. Um, so yeah, possibly, you know, they're using an altruistic strategy when they're making pricing decisions and they forego like capturing additional savings in order to benefit the other platform actors. So since we found that pricing isn't the main reason that they would, you know, um, participate in this platform, there are definitely some additional determinants of their willingness to pay. For example, in Spain, people who consider themselves to be early technology adopters and who have high interest in technology and innovation, they are more willing to pay than other groups. So maybe you know they would just pay more in the platform just for the ability to like use such an innovative way of you know getting electricity. <laughs> um, in Spain and the UK, we found that people who had more pro-environmental beliefs, like they were concerned about climate change, they were more willing to pay in the platform. So I think that they probably were just, they know that using the platform is beneficial to the environment. So yeah, they would be more willing to pay than others. They might even pay a premium on electricity in the platform like the UK consumers. Um, across all three countries, we found that independence from people who desire independence from their electricity suppliers, they were more willing to pay for electricity in the platform. So they had higher willingness to pay. And that's interesting because maybe instead of maximizing, you know, benefits in the form of saving, they might be interested in maximizing, you know, benefits in the form of independence, knowing that in the platform they do have to rely on, you know, large corporations when they can, you know, contribute to their support their neighbors, you know, people in their community and who are, you know, providing them with green local electricity. In the UK, we found that people who more who are more trusting um, uh, have a higher willingness to pay for electricity. And in Italy, people with degrees and people who currently have large electricity suppliers have a higher willingness to pay as well. So this is in line with like some theory in the area. For example, with the pro-environmental. Individuals usually act pro-socially and engage in pro-environmental behavior, even if it is at an additional cost to them. So that might explain why people with pro-environmental behavior have a higher willingness to pay. Then with the desire for independence, this could be because people generally distrust their electricity retailers. For example, this survey that was conducted by the UK Energy Research Centre, they found that consumers were generally dissatisfied with the profits that energy companies make, and they thought that some of the profits should go towards energy systems change. So maybe these people, you know, they find that instead of paying the electricity supplier high amounts, um, instead they could pay the same amount of money or in some cases more to like just people in their community who are selling excess electricity. And I think they would probably rather support local people instead of large companies making profit. And then finally with trust, which we found in the UK, um, studies have found that trust allows a society to conduct transactions with greater efficiency, and trust is also associated with unselfish behavior. So that might explain why the people in the UK who are more trusting had a higher willingness to pay for electricity in the platform, because they, I guess, not really selfish, 
and you know they don't want to take all of the benefits of the platform for themselves. So in conclusion, if this platform, you know, are diffused more, consumers will be faced with a social dilemma where they have to decide between maximizing individual benefits or maximizing community benefits. And this dilemma will kind of come to reality when they have to decide, you know, fair amounts, like if they use a double option mechanism and they have to decide the maximum amount they're willing to pay. So this is where, you know, they'll be faced with, with this dilemma. But the results on that, the consumers weren't only interested in maximizing savings. Like it wasn't, you know, the only thing, I guess, that they already used the platform for. Because when they had the opportunity and the right information, they didn't attempt to like, bid really low amounts that they are willing to pay to prosumers. So instead, they might act pro-socially and you know, consider benefits to the community and the environment. So I think that if these results were carried out in practice, like in an actual platform, co consumers will cooperate, you know, they'll place fair bids. And this is important because like I mentioned in the beginning, um, this is the ideal condition for sustainable and operation, operational peer-to-peer -peer platform because without them cooperating, without them, you know, placing fair bids and being fair to all members of the platform, then it just won't really work. Um, so yeah, that was one of the challenges that needed to be addressed. So I think that going forward, policymakers and regulators they could consider the potential of the platform to promote the exchange of affordable energy. Because as you saw, consumers were making a bit of savings compared to the energy tariffs, and prosumers would make a fair amount of earnings because there's kind of no middleman to take away the you know, difference. So it could definitely help in, you know, maximizing social welfare, especially in times like this, you know, with rising electricity prices. And since consumers could make these additional earnings, I think that it would definitely encourage technology adoption as well, because if consumers see, oh, if I install this microgeneration technology, I join a platform, you know, I could make some extra earnings by selling excess electricity. So I think they should definitely consider, you know, the use of the platform for maximizing social welfare, encouraging technology adoption, which would have spillover effects on other benefits, like increased renewable energy production and consumption, reduction in greenhouse gases can help meet net zero targets. So it's something that, you know, could be considered once we know for sure that, you know, people would cooperate and that the platform would be functional. So willingness to pay and pricing strategies could also be country specific because as we saw, the Spanish consumers were more interested in maximizing savings compared to UK and Italy. And it should also be considered that individuals with different characteristics might be willing to pay more. So if you know policymakers and you know platform developers were trying to promote a platform like this and to encourage people to participate and to you know pay more and like make fair bills, they should definitely consider these different characteristics and encourage these specific groups to participate. So some references, um, that's it, thank you.